Thanks everyone for coming. We're excited to have you here at RJ Julia Bookstore. I'm Michael, an event host. We're joined tonight by three wonderful authors for an evening that should be a lot of fun. It will be a lot of fun, I'm sure of it. Uh, after a short introduction, we'll hear from tonight's guest, then we'll have a period of, uh, for questions from the audience. And then after we've concluded in here, we'll have a book signing just in the other room, uh, right where you came in the main entrance. We've got, if you don't already have a copy of The Skeptic's Guide to the Future or The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe, pick one up at this register or at the other register. There's a, a good stack for them. Certainly, they'd make a great uh, holiday present also. Um, I guess depending on who you're buying for. Most people, I'm sure, would appreciate it though. Uh, so we've got three special guests tonight. Uh, Bob Novella, Jay Novella, Dr. Stephen Novella. In their new book, The Skeptic's Guide to the Future, the team builds upon the work of futurists of the past by examining what they got right as well as what they got wrong. They explore the pitfalls of each era and then lay out their own speculations about the distant future including advances in genetic ma manipulation, artificial intelligence, and quantum computing. Here's my favorite line from a description of the book. I think it's actually on the inside cover, but uh, our predictions of the future are a wild fantasy inextricab inextricably linked to our present hopes and fears, biases, and ignorance. And now we'll hear from Stephen, Bob, and Jay. Someone here is from Rhode Island. Thanks, thanks for making the trip. Appreciate it. Wow. Um, we're Bob, Jay, and I are really super excited about this book. This is you know, a lot of fun to write. I do want a couple of uh, business things. I'm three weeks out from COVID, so I may have to cough every now and then. I'm, well, not, I'm not contagious. <laughs> but I'll try to. But I, will, I may pause for that. I'm also on call, so there's a small chance I may have to answer a call from the hospital. Bob and Jay will be fine without me for a few minutes, but I apologize ahead of time if that happens. What we'll do is while Steve's on the call, I'll pretend like I'm the guy on the call with him. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor, oh, my back. You know, that type of stuff. Right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's get to the book. So the book, The Skeptic's Guide to the Future, what is it about? Obviously, it's about... 150 pages? <laughs> um, it's not about predicting the future, per se, because it's actually one of the things we address in the book is what does it mean to predict the future? You could really only do it in sort of the broadest brushstrokes. Like I could say, for example, I could predict the future with 100% accuracy. Science and technology will continue to progress indefinitely into the future. Right? That's a pretty much a, 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 a high probability accurate prediction. It's not very precise. There's not a lot of detail in there. The more detailed you try to get, the harder it is. And then, then you get down into like predicting the weather. Right? You really can't. You really can't do it. But also, I think another critical point is um, it, predicting the future kind of assumes the future is inevitable and we make the point very clearly you know, early in the book the future is not inevitable we're crafting the future with the choices that we make and the decisions that we you know and how, how we interact with our technology etc so we, we, we can't predict what the future is because we don't know what the billions of decisions are going to be over the, you know, as the years play out we could really only talk about potential future and how our choices will shape those those potential futures and and how people make decisions and then we could sort of constrain it by the large patterns of, of technology and advancement and sometimes we have to get into the laws of physics to say is that even possible um, again we always take a skeptical eye it's like, that, can that even happen so we could talk about that uh, and again the, my favorite way of demonstrating that the future is not inevitable is to say that the present wasn't yes. inevitable. Like if you went back in time 100 or 150 years, you couldn't say with any certainty that our present time would look the way it does, right? I mean, there's so many zigs and zags along the way. We could look back and go, wow, that didn't have to play out that way, you know? If the Hindenburg didn't blow up, you know, Zeppelins might have continued to be a major way of getting cargo across, you know, the ocean, or there would be luxury, you know, Zeppelin line airships you know, to this day, there's no reason why that wouldn't have happened. That was one quirky event that could have changed even history. Cars. cars, yeah. Even cars over a century ago, if somebody had predicted that the future will be steam-powered cars or electric cars in the in the very near future over a century ago, you, we might look at back and say that's ridiculous because clearly that's not what happened. Only now are we developing electric cars and steam cars. That that, that never would have happened. So we would have thought. 
this person is ridiculous and it was just another horrible prediction. But no, if you look back at that time, there was three, three different types of cars that were in development that could have been developed. It was the, you know, the, the combustion, internal combustion engine, steam powered and electric, and they were all viable. They all, could have, they all could have happened, but because of quirks of history, they didn't happen. Like the, the, uh, the battery, the, the electric car, was it Ford, just had, was some, for some personal reason, he said he shut that down. And never and it never happened. He was going to do that after his um, his, his after the Model A. So, Model yeah, so, so basically, that one industrialist pretty much determined the next century of yeah. cars, and he very easily and almost did make a different decision. You know, and there's also infrastructure reasons, which you know, which are also a quirky. Like crude oil was discovered at, by, by luck in Pennsylvania. You know, what if that happened 20 years later? Like, there's nothing inevitable about that. That might have given electric cars that critical advantage. So there's all these contingent things, um, but what we take a look at the book at not just like trying to envision what the future may be like, but also we take a look at futurism itself, like the science of of thinking about the future, of predicting the future. We we list a bunch of what we call futurism fallacies, like the common mistakes that futurists of the past make. One of my favorites is the notion that they made these assumptions about what people prioritize without ever really questioning the assumption. Like it was just, they didn't even realize they were making that assumption. So if you look at futurists from the 1920s, 1930s, that everyone assumed that convenience and luxury were going were the only reasons why we would choose one technology over another. Right? That technology in the future would be leading to this utopia of convenience and luxury. And that was it. Those are the only concerns. But of course, that's not the way technology plays out. We have lots of other reasons why we, we might choose one technology over another. Um, <coughs> well, they also like projected their current culture yeah. into the future. So like if you go back, there's a lot of videos that we were looking at of uh, you know, like GE put out a video about like what's it, what's it going to be like in the 19... You know, the year two thousand or whatever, and it was a, literally like a, t a '50s TV show with some tech in it. Yeah, <laughs> but it, the same relationships, the same cultural, you know, benchmarks and all that stuff. Right. Because we always imagine ourselves in the future, right? Because that's the fun part. Like, right? what would we do with that cool technology? And and to, laughably, sometimes, like uh, even Isaac Asimov, like a giant of science fiction, yes. and famous for his his prescient futurism. When he first wrote the Foundation series in the, 19th, the late 1930s and then published in the 1940s, the first book, it's, it's literally people from the 1930s, thousands of years and thousands of years in the future, like still like the exact patriarchy of the 1930s. Getting the teleporter, see? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's exactly, <laughs> literally, yeah. They're wearing hats, smoking cigars, like com completely. You look at the early science fiction movies, like the 40s and 50s, like Forbidden Planet, one of our favorite yeah. you know, classic science fiction Great movies. movies. Yeah, but the... You know, the characters in this, like, 3,000 years in the future came right off of a World War II destroyer. Yeah. I mean, like, the zero cultural evolution. And I think it was only centuries in the future, not thousands. No, it wasn't. Okay, whatever. Yeah. But it was, it, the thing is, it was obsolete 10 years later. Like, their vision right. of the future was obsolete within 10 or 20 years. Yeah. Or the, and even, like, there was the 1950s video that we reviewed where they were predicting the 1970s. So they're just 20 years in the future and they were just promoting their car, you know, that this new car technology was totally bombed because of reasons they didn't anticipate. But it's that's particularly hilarious because they completely missed the cultural revolution of the 60s. So you have 1950s characters in their fictitious 1970s and you know, the doting housewife, yeah. you know, all she's, all she's concerned about is what do I make my husband for dinner when she gets home? Yeah. Uh, the thing about that video that I thought was ridiculous was the, uh, like, if you're in the next room, you know, your husband's in the kitchen and you're in the living room, you would communicate with, a, like, a video wall. Yeah. You wouldn't just walk around the corner and talk to them face to face. Like, everything had, a, had to have, like, a techie angle to it. Yeah, so that's another fallacy we talk about. People, often futurists, imagine we're doing things differently just because it's the future. You know, so we can't do it the same as we're doing it today. But actually, technology has a remarkable persistence into the future because we're not going to ditch things that work just because there's a more complicated way to do it. One of the things I, we, we ask people, readers to do, like when you're reading the book, look around you wherever you are, your environment, and look at the material that you're surrounded with. Most of it we've been using for 
thousands of years, right? Like plastic is like the one exception. Aluminum is also kind of a space age technology. <clears throat> Generally, it's wood and stone and concrete and glass and ceramic, paper. These are things that have been in use for thousands of years. And they're still like the best choices. Yeah. Something I wrote one time just, you know, because I, I, as part of my own like more fiction writing, I asked myself a question. If I had to make the very best sword out of totally modern materials, what would it be, right? And I researched a lot of it. You know what the answer I came up with was? Steel. Yep. Yeah, steel. steel is still the best. By a steel long shot. I know. It's like, really? We have to come up with anything better than just high quality mm -hmm. steel in a couple of thousand years? Like, yeah, it's still, it's just really, really good, you know? Um, that's another thing that futures miss is that the persistence, <coughs> the persistence of the technology in the future. I, you know, in the hundreds of years, we will probably be making dinner using a, a sharp knife and cutting your vegetables that way. You're not, you know, they're not necessarily going to have lasers cutting the food. <laughs> they're, they're, you know, somebody looking from the past, looking at a modern kitchen, would understand a lot of it, or a, or a good chunk of it, or even looking at a modern car would still understand a good chunk of it. It's not. You yeah, know, yeah. It's, it, it, so things hang out. Things hang well, they, around. The, Technologies for a long in time. In line with that too, Bob. Like, it's funny to think like they're so ready to ditch like cooking. Cooking is like the, one of the first things that we do that they throw away. All of the futures and things we looked at. It's all like pre-chewed food or pre <laughs> pre-frozen. <laughs> yeah. Everything was automatic. A computer making. No, we're still. That, again, that was the convenience over quality, right? And they just assumed, of course, we're going to have all pre-frozen, pre-digested. But cooking is is joyful, you know. Like, yeah. Like, what about the experience? Like, they, yeah. they almost are stripping out some humanity in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How about the pill? Like from um, Lost in Space, it, the they, pills. The pills. That's that was their food. That was just because it's the future. That, was, that would be <laughs> nice, though. I mean, that would be pretty damn useful. Like, if you're on a long drive, you know. You're, you have super condensed food in pill form, you yeah. just drink it. That'd be great. What, Protein for bar. emergencies, once in a while, fine. But that enjoyment of, of you know, the enjoyment of eating, yeah. as you know, Jay. Of course, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's amazing that they even thought that that was actually a viable So, prediction. And we're still just talking about the first section of the book. Right, let's move on a little bit. So the, the middle section is really about current technology. It's not even about future technology. We, we take a look at big types of technology, like transportation and energy and things like that, and manufacturing. And we, and we spent a lot of time talking about the history of that technology leading up to today. And the goal is to sort of to keep going a little bit. Say, okay, this is the arc of this history. This is how this technology has changed. And now where is it going? You know, where if we 20, 50, 100 years in the future. And what about what's the most mature version of this we could imagine, like in, indefinitely in the future? It's hard to put a number on it. It's like impossible. But basically limited by the laws of physics at that point. Yeah, at that point, what's the ultimate expression of it? Like, how good can it potentially get at some far distant point? So we do it? make a lot of predictions, but yeah. it's more... But we give ourselves a lot of wiggle. Yeah, I mean, it's in a way, it's tongue-in-cheek, because we're telling you in the first couple of chapters why you, why you really can't do it successfully. So it was just fun. It really, like, okay, it's a well, lot of fun. You know, like, talking about, like, what's nanotechnology going to be like in 500 years or 1,000 years? Like, it's fascinating. It's, it's a you. fascinating thing to talk about. <laughs> And, and the power, it's so powerful, but mm. but so many things have to happen. There's a lot of choices, though. Like, yeah. I, well, here's a good example of the choices thing, like the Segway. You guys remember the Segway, right? They finally shut down production of yep. it. But when it came out, it was going to change human transportation. Why didn't it? Not just that. I remember specifically, I remember, but yeah. it was it was a, a mystery for a little while. They were like, we have a big announcement. Yeah, yeah. And it, they said that cities will be built around this new technology. Cities will be built around yeah. it. And that was what the problem. It? They weren't. Yeah. So there's an infrastructure problem, right? <laughs> Not technology. The technology is brilliant. You know, they, they, it's just brilliant Auto technology. stabilizing. Yeah. yeah. But, and for, to be fair, that technology spilled out into many very useful yes, things that sure. are, that are the being underlying used today. technology. Absolutely. Like people, right. people that need wheelchairs and you know, uh, wheelchairs that can go up and down stairs. Yeah, and all a that classic stuff. example. They did not see any of those alternate uses they had pretty much one or two main predictions that utterly failed. Yeah. And they, they didn't anticipate all the other uses, which is probably one of the most difficult things to predict, is that, yeah. you know, how people how are people going to use this technology? That is truly hard to do. Right. Until you put it in the hands of billions of people, you don't know. Right. Right. And the other often cited reason why it failed is because people thought they looked dorky, right? <laughs> With, and so, like, again, it's, not that it's the thing you can't predict. You know, every futurist thought we would be using video phones by now, like routinely. Mm -hmm. FaceTime sometimes, right? That's a special occasion with your kid or your grandkids or something. But for day-to-day, -day, everyday communication, nobody uses text. We text. 
Yeah. No one predicted you imagine? that. I know, and, and I hated texting when it first came out. I absolutely hated yeah. texting. But now it's like my primary because way Because no one anticipated the utter joy of communicating in virtual time. Yeah. Like, you don't right. have to be engaging with somebody in real time. You don't have to coordinate your schedules. They have to both be both of the available at the same time. You just shoot off a message, and you'll, you'll get a response whenever. And that trumped even right. everything else. And again, you just can't anticipate. Plus, they also the other angle though is you could dip into a conversation quick and then get out. You don't have hi, yeah. how are you? What's new? What's going All on? All the social crap goes right, away, and then yeah. hit the main reason why you're texting them. So that's the other reason I think. It's very efficient. Yeah. So, but it is fun to say, all right, in 2050, what's our energy infrastructure going to look like? We could actually make some reasonable statements yeah. about that. 2100, or 2100. It gets a little harder because then there's there are wild cards in there. Is fusion power going to work out? It's yes, probably going to work out eventually. Yes. but exactly when and how well you know, like how well Bob and I disagree on the when, but whatever. We both agree eventually it's it, probably going to work. It can work out. in fifteen years, but then before it's commercialized, probably forty. Years, it could take fifty years. decades beyond. Yeah, and then that. one of them is not going to do it too. You have to build a, a massive infrastructure. Yeah. You're going to need you're going to need a thousand fusion reactors to, to do what we need them to do. But the other thing is, by the time that happens, how cheap is solar energy? Right. Yeah. Because you can't just, that's another fallacy, you can't just think of one technology. You have to think of yes. how all technologies are advancing at the same time and what the competition is. That's why you can't, and partly why you can't envision us using that future technology. Because not only will it not be us culturally, we will have, you know, our descendants will have access to other technology. They may, in fact, be genetically engineering themselves or be cyborgs with computer mm -hmm. in in implants. So, it's like not like us versus the robots. We might be the robots in 100 or 200 years. And again, will that happen? We don't know. Maybe people don't like it, you know, or maybe they'll love it. And it be, there'll, there'll be somebody comes out with the killer app, and then it becomes inevitable at that point. The killer genetic the app? The killer? <laughs> or whatever. Just like it could be a form of robotics that is beyond, I mean, beyond biology. I mean, we think a clunky metal robot, but. You know, what we say is robot in 100 years, that could be something that's even more complicated than even biology itself. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> then we get into some technologies that don't exist yet, talking about, like, will they exist? And th that, was a, that was a very interesting section because, you know, we changed our minds about some of yeah. that yeah. in the process of doing the research. I think the big one is, uh, without revealing too much, we were all pretty much fans of the idea of a space elevator because it makes a lot of sense in a lot of ways. But when you really look at the details, it's like, mm, it's just not going to happen. Just that was a bummer. Happen. I remember when we yeah. had that conversation, <laughs> and, uh, and like, it, it, it hit us all kind of at the same time. We're like, oh, Christ, it's not, no, nope, it's not going to work. It just can't work. Right. And, it, but there's, a, again, unless there's a wild card, unless somebody says, some, oh, wait a minute. Exotic material. We could do yeah. this, and then suddenly it does work, but it's uh, just very... Uh, but it's not physics work. Doesn't, doesn't have a lot of good things to say about that. Not on the Earth, anyway. It might be good for Mars. Um, I liked all the space travel. That is the yeah, whole space travel. Of course, the future is yeah. about space travel. Right? Yeah. right. <laughs> the rocket chapters are my favorite. They're yeah, so yeah. much fun. And again, this is, it's interesting, because like, we've been talking about this for our whole lives. <clears throat> we've been doing the SGU for 17 and a half years. I've written thousands of articles on my, on my blog. And yet when you sit down, like the three of us dig in to write a chapter on a very specific topic and like get totally up to date and totally debunked, like shit, this is different than we thought it was. Yeah. As much as we knew about it, like there's nuance here that we never really dug down to and it just changes our perspective. So that that whole section was very fun to write too, because yeah, you know, there's a lot of exciting things about space travel. I'll, well, let me just say this. Everything you've ever seen in science fiction is wrong. Yeah. It's, Space travel is not going to look like anything I've ever seen depicted in science fiction. And there's a big reason for that is because science fiction needs to tell a story. And if it had to stick to what space travel is really going to be like, it's going to be hard. You can't have your heroes zipping around, you know, because it's just, you know, there's going to be significant challenges. Or our, our, our descendants who are going to be traveling in space are going to be very different from us. And it's less, we want to tell stories about people like us, right? But that's probably not the people who are going to be zipping around in space. So, but that aside, there's still the tremendous potential for, for space travel. It's just going to be different, I think, than what most people think. And, but, and making like, like the, you know, the thing that we <coughs> found out was like, what are the next engines going to be, right? So yeah. like a, nuclear is very likely to be like the one that they create and then the one that's used potentially for the next thousand years, right? Like once we hit fusion, like once we get a fusion engine, that's pretty much it. Yeah, for the foreseeable future. Everything beyond that is like 
so far in the future you can't even predict them. It's yeah, like possible. Anti antimatter yeah. engines, black hole engines, they're all <laughs> weird, possible. Weird, crazy black hole they're all, engines. They're all feasible, mm -hmm. possible. They're not breaking really any laws of physics, but that, you know, we're, you know, if we ever see them, it's going to be after we have had, like, <coughs> super tweaked out fusion engines for, for potentially centuries, unless, of course, we develop an, an artificial super intelligence, which means we could have it in, you know, six months. But that's just, you know, that's that's just an aside. And do we want <laughs> that? That's, that's, that's do we the, want uh, it? But will they be using it? So, you know, yeah, yeah, we, right. we learned a lot about, we had to do a deep dive into quantum computing, and it is so unbelievably complicated and difficult. Like, so we do the research, and then Steve writes the first version of the chapter, and I'm, and I'm listening to Bob and Steve talk about it, and I literally, I'm like, record scratch, I don't get it. I don't understand the, the, the way you know because Jay, Jay yeah. reads the chapter and is like, I don't understand any of this. So then we had to rewrite it so that Jay could understand it, <laughs> which was good. And then I had to rewrite it again so that our editor could understand it. <laughs> so hopefully, hopefully it's, it's, but the bottom line is that there's no way really to understand. We don't even understand it. The problem is you have to be a quantum physicist to understand it. And even they don't really understand <laughs> <laughs> There's like three people in the world who actually understand it, but... The, 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 the trick there is like, all right, what is a level of description of it right. that is that accurate as far as it goes yes. for somebody who doesn't understand quantum mechanics? And I think we got there. I think no, we eventually got there. And, and But the cool part is, all right, but whether or not you understand how it works, when it actually is working, this is what it can do. And yeah. it's amazing. Yeah. That's, that's what I love yeah. fight. I mean, because, you know, trying to wrap your head around the physics is like really mostly a waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> but it is good to learn about what's the difference between a quantum computer and a, and a home computer. Yeah. Like and that's the part I love. Because, like, you know, we kept asking the same, you know, series of questions. Like, what are they going to use it for? What's it going to be really good at? Who's going to actually have them? Like, you yeah. know, like, it, it's going to be... Like, like there are certain... Here's, here's like a... Governments and here's, hackers. Like, institutions will... There are them. certain kinds of problems. Not all kinds of problems. There are certain kinds of problems that the quantum computer is optimized for. And for those kinds of problems... It can do like a power, like a reasonably powerful super, uh, quantum computer, not one we have now, but one we're hoping to have in twenty or thirty years. It could solve that equation in fifteen minutes, and it would take. Well, I forget the number, but it's like you would need a, a billion more. galaxies worth of com Regular conventional computers. computers, and it would still take a trillions of years. Like it is, <laughs> it's basically impossible for a regular computer to do it. They're unsolvable. And a quantum computer can do it in 15 minutes, like one quantum computer. So, so that's make, why, you know. They make a, a quantum computer could make billions of calculations simultaneously. Yes. That's why it's so fast. And they're going to use it for like weather modeling, is the perfect example. Right. You, have, you, have, you have like quadrillions of particles that they want to track in a computer yeah. and see what, you know, what they do with each other. That's the big one is security. Yeah. You, right. can, you, can make, you can decrypt anything with it, right? You can, so it, all existing encryption is obsolete mm -hmm. but you could also use it to encrypt so whoever has the most powerful quantum computer owns all data in the world yeah, imagine that. Wow. Um, and then we finish up with just straight up science fiction technology right and we're just talking about is this even possible like what is what does physics have to say about lightsabers anti-gravity and, anti -gravity and tractor, beams. tractor beams and shielding <laughs> and ray guns and things like that. So that was just pure, pure fun. But, but there's actually serious science behind it because, you know, sure. and, and not surprisingly, there are lots of experts who have written articles on things like, how would you build a lightsaber? So there's an actual answer to the question yeah. of, like, yeah. is it feasible and what it would be like and everything. Um, so that was just, that was a pure fun one. And then interspersed throughout, um, I wrote a series of vignettes, which are just, um, they're not even quite short stories. They're just science fiction glimpses of the future, just to sort of put you in, like, what would a world look like where these technologies are in play or being used? Um, okay, unless you guys have something very specific you want to say, uh, we want to leave plenty of time for, for questions because this yeah. is the fun part. So ask away, what do you want to know about the future? Yeah. Can you solve the commuting problem? <clears throat> just how about ordinary transportation? And yeah, so... We spent the whole chapter on transportation, um, and so there's, a, there's going to be a lot more options for commuting in the future. You know, there are, and there are some trends which I think are pretty inevitable. I think I think electric cars are going to take over. Oh, yeah. Just the efficiencies are greater than all other options. 
you know, we they haven't cracked the hydrogen storage problem, and it, by the time they do, the electric vehicles are going to be too. In, the I'm about like transponder regulation and stuff like that. You know, where transponders will for be traffic. in vehicles for traffic tracking and that. Type yeah. So of then stuff. there's the smart car thing, right? Right. where you can, like, the hive mind of traffic, so that it's optimized. That's coming. That's there's already sort of the right. beginnings of that. Then what about flying cars? It's actually a thing, you know. I know that's like the trope of the future always has the flying cars. It's not as far away as it's not as far as you think. But yeah. it's drone. It's basically a big drone, right? So we know that the technology works, and we I know it scales up. I mean, it comes it's, down to batteries at this point. It comes down to batteries, right. which we know are you know it's just a, when do they when are they going to get energy dense enough that is yeah. that is that is plausible? And there's already been calculations about the fact that depending on where you're going, it's actually more energy efficient than driving on the road. If, you, if you're like stuck in traffic or have to go around a huge you know, geographic obstacle, it could actually be more efficient to just hop over with a, with a flying vehicle. Well, well, that's another thing I would ask to kind of follow up on that. Yeah. In all of this stuff that you're doing, is so much of it is follow the money? <coughs> yeah, sure. a lot of it is. Yeah. Politics, yeah. yeah. yeah like and and yeah. infrastructure. Yeah. That's like infrastructure, that's, like, that's why the Segway failed. That's why a, a gasoline beat out electric mostly. <laughs> Um, infrastructure is huge, like, and that's why that's one of the big choices that we make. What infrastructure are we going to collectively invest in? That's the technology that's yeah. going to win, probably. And, and we back, are back to transportation and driving. Maybe a lot of it's going to go away yeah. because you're going to stay home and you'll have telepresence right. and you can be pretty much appear anywhere on the planet in in any in, in all the ways <coughs> that are significant in terms of interacting with people. Eventually, yeah. even in touch interaction. So maybe and that's a good go general away. principle that we. Get back to is <coughs> that one technology tr yeah. completely trumping enough. If you ask, if you ask the question, what will transportation look like in the future? You can't think about it in isolation. You have to think about all the other mm -hmm. technologies that are advancing at the same time. And so, by the time we get to like a robust flying car or whatever, we may just decide that we're just not going to commute. You know, like the, the, or the commuting will be much less. Well, than Steve, it is now. we've already made that decision. I know, but that, right, the, the pandemic kind of jumped us ahead yeah. ten years. Mm -hmm. That that trend was already there. Um, so you have to, there's going to be competing sort of issues. And the other thing is, most of the time, when you think, is it going to be A, B, or C, the answer is yes. It's like all of those things will exist simultaneously. And then D. And, and then there'll be something else thrown in. They, they just sort of fill, they sort of complement each other and, and sort of everyone goes to their own sort of corner. It's like, you know, TV didn't replace radio. Radio just became a different thing in order to stay out of TV's way, right? But it that didn't go away. And like streaming didn't kill the movies. I mean, the pandemic did, but <laughs> but it didn't. People still liked the experience of sitting in the theater with a bunch of other people. How did you apply your skeptic's lens to your vision of the future? That's a great question. Yeah, that is a great. Question. It is the skeptic's guy to the future. So part of it is um, saying what things are just not going to happen, or probably not going to happen because they're scientifically implausible, right? So that's where we had to put our enthusiasm, you know, our techno. File, and know, we have a lot. Aside, <laughs> we have a lot of that. Yeah. Put that aside. Go. Yeah, but can it work? And not only can it work, you know, will people make this choice? Will you know? Will it, the safety issues, like with the with the space elevator, even if you can get it to work, it's so vulnerable to terrorism. Mm -hmm. Like it's so catastrophically <laughs> vulnerable to that. It's hard to imagine we're gonna make the investment in something so fragile. Yeah. So. Uh, you know that and and the the, the futures and the fallacies. futures of fallacies. That's, that's like those are critical skeptical. thinking foul. That's like core yeah, skeptical yeah. thinking. Just what are the, th the thinking errors that futurists generally make? Let's identify them, spell not, them and out, do them, and then not make them. And we refer back to them throughout the book. It's like nope, this is you know we're not going to commit this fallacy. Or we're going to correct it, etc. So first of all, your quantum computing chapter was excellent. Oh boy. Yes. Uh, is the candidate thing specific to you guys, or did you pick that up? The, the candidate, the two mayor thing? Um, did we make that up, or did we read that somewhere? I forget. Did we reference anyway, it? It was great. It was great. So, yeah, if we have, so, which, which one? You know, have, you have two candidates, and before the election, which one is the mayor? Oh. They're both the mayor. They both have the potential, the same yeah, potential yeah. to be the mayor. They're in a quantum superposition yeah. of mayorhood. And then the election happens, and then one becomes the mayor, and one isn't. Yeah. That's not my question. Yeah. So my question relates to something you say in the conclusion, which information itself is increasingly our most powerful resource overriding all others. So I wondered if you could expand a little bit on that and then specifically talk about news and then news 
papers. Yeah, so I mean, think about how important information is in terms of the currency of our modern civilization. My current favorite example of that is Steve Jobs, right? This one of the richest people in the world. So he had an abundance of every resource you can imagine, except one. He didn't have any critical thinking. Didn't have the, cri the information and the critical thinking for a critical life decision. And, and you know, we, we never say that he died because he, he delayed conventional treatment, because it's you can't make an individual statement like that, but it's plausible. But he had a totally treatable cancer. He chose not to treat it with conventional medicine, and he did die of that cancer. The rich, one of the richest guys in the world. That was just an information deficit. Not and he, again, he's such a perfect example because every other resource he had an absolute, almost unlimited supply. You know, the um, we took. You know, there's a lot of talk you know, contemporarily about the digital divide. You know, like that's one of the strongest predictors of success now. It, it, think about it, you, you have access to any information you want, as long as you have the tools at your disposal. The real currency now is the ability to, to sort, define oh, the information yes. you want and to distinguish good information from bad information. That's, you know, you have that, everything else is there. And that's gonna be increasingly so, I mean, mm -hmm. think about it. If you really knew what you were doing in terms of accessing information, would you, would you really need to pay a college $100,000 to basically access the same information? I mean, you, you could find the best lectures online. You could, it's, all, it's all there. And then if we, the other thing we were referring to, if you extrapolate out technology, and this is where we take like all the threads, this is like towards the end of the book, where we're trying to take all the threads that we've been pulling on the whole book and sort of bring, where's it all going? One of the overarching trends is the, the, um, you know, the digital transformation where everything just becomes information and everything else gets basically replaced by just information. At some point, when you carry out these technologies to their logical conclusion, you know, like when you have like nanotechnology, foglets, whatever, you know, it, the, the physical world around us will be essentially digital in a way, right? It'll be, yeah. we'll be able to control the physical world the same way we control our virtual world. And we are building the technology to do that right now. And therefore, the, the world will basically just be information at that point. And that will be the, the only real and ultimate currency. That and energy. Are books going to go away? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's an, that's an interesting question, right? Because we have, you know, audio books, we have e-books, you can get versions of e both, both of our books in the ebook version, the Kindle version, you know, the audiobook version. But we still buy physical books sure, because we just like it. Actually up now. Yeah, right. And because that's again the, the the newer sexy technological way of doing it. Yes. This, the, it, it I do both, right? I have my Kindle for when I want to have a bunch of books in my in my iPad. But when I can get my hands on a physical book, I enjoy the experience of doing that more. So again the, the technologies exist side by side and complement each other. So I'm 95% audio, yeah. audio books. But whatever, it depends on your lifestyle too. Like Bob got into audio books because he was commuting a lot and that yeah. was a really great way to make use of all that time. Oh, yeah. You talked about um, people extrapolating current culture out into the future. I think an exception to that would be like Star Trek. They imagined uh, a different culture. Any, yeah. Do you get into like the future of culture at all? And yeah, yeah, absolutely. Things? Yeah, we, we directly get into that. But we don't try to, we're not, it's not a sociology book, right? So we're not talking about like from a historical or sociological point of view, because that's just beyond the scope of our book and our expertise. But we do just talk about how that relates to futurism, like how people f project culture into the future. And, and also good futurism tries not to do that, right? Mm -hmm. So one example of, of how fragile this is, is like we, because we lived through the digital divide, you know, we were born in an analog world, we're gonna die in a digital world. Our kids are, are all of a generation where their relationship to technology is different than ours. Like the technology we're using, our kids use it differently. One generation, 30, 20, 30 years, and already like Im imagining our, our generation using this technology is a fail. We, we, you know, we, had no, we did not anticipate, and we still struggle to understand why they're using the technology the way they're using, because they grew up in a different world than we grew up in. 
So what are people going to be like who grow up in a world where genetic manipulation is more every day? The very concept of what a human is, like, we're going to be old-fashioned yeah. and parochial. Like you, you think a human has to look like a traditional, evolved human? What, what does it mean to be human? You know, how many, how many machine parts do you have, have to have before you're not human anymore? <laughs> so part of the thing, which I think, you know, where we get into the sociology of the psychology of that, I think... <clears throat> And whatever we think now, it's 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 obsolete. Yeah. And that's not what the people of the future are going to think. I think that's the one thing we could say for sure. Whatever, whoever they're going to be, they're not going to be us. <laughs> and and any ideas that we have about what's human and what's you know appropriate, and whatever is is going to look passe. It's just like us looking at people in the 19th century and their view, like Victorian sensibilities, like seem like you know you know, ridiculous yeah, we, to us. It's going to be the same. But we we experience that cultural change like think about how differently we, we thought about things in the 70s and oh, the sure. 80s yeah. you know like we in our own generation <coughs> yeah we've personally changed but also we see the generational change yeah. as well Go ahead. yeah i have a george Crowd inspired question yeah if you had a time machine that you could instantly travel to any date in the future you know year hundred million billion years in the future how far would you go to check <laughs> things out and yeah, that's a good would your answer change if the trip was one way? <laughs> yeah, so we, we've had that discussion. That's a great question, and we've, we've thought about that a lot. And it does depend on whether, if, if you can come back, then it, you know, that would, I would go much farther into the future. Um, the, the, my approach to that was I'd want to think about, like, where would the sweet spot be where the technology would be the most advanced and awesome and cool, and I get to do cool things like travel to other stars or whatever, but not so advanced that like I was an insect compared to the people who were around at that time. Like there, there has to be still some connection to the people of that time, and that's a hard it sweet is. spot to hit. But that's what that's what I would be aiming for. I would suspect it's something like a thousand or two thousand. Oh, years I think now. that's pretty far. Right. That, that's <laughs> way farther in the future. I mean, I would There's think. No way. I would think a, you know, Steve. The problem is the singularity. When that well, pops, that's the game changer. And if you're right. if you're on the other side of the singularity, the world is. Then so you might as well go for broke. You might as well go for a thousand. Years. I would like. I would think a couple of hundred years would be. Yeah, would be amazing. that's safe. Wait, what hundred. Do you mean by the singularity? Yeah, that's that's a point. That's a, there's, there's, there's lots of theoretical, definitions. Theoretical. There's, there's lots of different ways that people look at it. The way I look at the singularity is, is the point in time when we have <coughs> essentially an intelligence explosion where we can create intelligences that that outstrip humanity to a dramatic degree. So that, actually, I would tweak that a little bit. Not we I, wouldn't I be the one. Okay. It's, <laughs> so we're, we're, we won't we won't be the ones creating the intelligence. It's the intelligence we created creating the intelligence. So, so you don't understand it anymore. Yeah, when you, you can't understand it in your current. Yeah, there's a process. recursive and that's the right. intelligence so, explosion. Yeah, yeah. Right. So super the, advanced computers designing even more super advanced right. computers, but and that just keeps the point is away. though that 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 changes are coming so fast and furious that you can't not you can't predict not only five years in the future but five weeks in the future is just like unpredictable because it's like your dog trying to understand geometry it's like you can't predict it it's going to change so fast so that's that's one way to let me, think let, me of add, let me add to it because bob you're so into it like you're missing like there's a descriptor that's I'm that's missing that's nothing that. great so <laughs> imagine imagine an artificial intelligence it doesn't even have to be conscious. It just needs the processing power. But it becomes so capable of thinking and doing research and advancing technology that it happens so fast that humans can't even keep up with what it's telling us. It could yeah. be literally dropping like this. Oh, you want a fusion reactor? No problem. I'm going to give you actually the one after the fusion reactor because it, it's progressing so fast and, and it's rewriting itself so fast that it becomes this monstrous brain that we don't even know how to communicate. Yeah, this is where the prediction becomes really tricky because there's so many ways this could play out. The right. One is, you know, like a, even AI now, we, we had a, we just interviewed an AI scientist recently and we've been really doing a deep dive on it. Even now, like our thinking is still evolving because there's, there's still news coming out, like things are still changing, the future is still happening. But like the AI is becoming so powerful, so fast, and we and we were trying to wrap our head around what's actually changing, what's actually happening that's making it so so powerful. But the, it's still a tool, though. It's a tool that people are using, right? It's not doing anything by itself. So that one question is even even when it gets like ridiculously powerful, how controlled is it going to be? And then the other thing is to what extent and when? And we know this is happening. This is already happening, but 
to what extent will we be that AI? Like, will we just be plugging into and to be an extension of ourselves? And, and so those are, those are questions we can't really answer yep. right now. Like how, what the timing of these advances are going to be. And then you get into the whole deep, the weeds about the difference between narrow AI and general AI. Like, will it be self-aware? Will it have its own intention? Will it be able to say no to us? You know, these are questions that we that are really hard to answer right now. Well, but right now, yeah, we have narrow AI. It is literally just a software program. There's no it's, consciousness. It's an expert in a very specific domain. It yeah. knows a lot about something very, but very incredibly narrow. powerful. But it's just a piece of software. Like yeah, we're not we're not talking tool. about any computer thinking in any way that a, a right. human does. But that's a that may be a false dichotomy though. Yeah. That, that's a, m meaning that when when na these narrow AIs. Either when you network enough of them together or they get powerful enough, will it be conscious? I think we're going to get to the point where we can't answer that question. We're going to have something that looks conscious and we won't know if it really is or not. Like, and, and also, related to that is, we don't really know what human consciousness is, right? Because we may right. be just a bunch of narrow AIs all networked together. Right? There doesn't appear to be any... Yeah, but it seems like yeah, no if, if there's enough, if there's enough of, of processing happening... <laughs> yeah like the way our brain is, that at some point, uh, self-awareness might just happen. It could, it could be an emergent, bit, an emergent yes. phenomenon. And it could be on a spectrum. It uh, doesn't necessarily mean... Absolutely, it, it, yeah. could, it could be a, a consciousness that's more like an insect or you know, or a small animal, yeah. or it yeah. could be a consciousness... So imagine, that, imagine an AI becoming you know, conscious for the first time, and it's an order of magnitude more intelligent than Well, humans. that's the thing. There's nothing magical about human-level intelligence, so once it gets to that point, it's going to blow right past it. So that's what we're talking about, the intelligence explosion. What happens when we have an AI that's a billion times smarter than a human being in terms of its ability yeah. to work through problems? You know, I, we can't answer that question. It's fun to think about, but it's yeah. not really answerable. And I so, would pick a cent, I would go a century. And that even that makes me nervous. Because, <laughs> but it depends how things play out. It depends. But I would go a century and really cross my fingers uh, mm -hmm. Because I, I mean, I could, we, I could potentially arrive at a time where there's no points of reference that I recognize, yeah. and it's like I'm just a bacteria swimming around. Like, what's mm -hmm. happening? Or, or I'm a dog. At, best case, case, it could be, it could, I could be a dog, and I would need help getting around. Because you know, like, all right, don't play in traffic, Bob, because you don't know, you can't understand traffic. Yeah. Sure, it could be longer than that, but it, we can't predict. We don't know when that, you know, when that that part of the curve. Well, is ma imagine crazy. giving somebody from the 1800s a smartphone. Yeah, you know. Yeah, but the difference is, we still have a recognizable human yeah, base. It'll be a hundred times worse. Yeah, than that. that's a quantitative what, difference. Not, it's not quality. Yeah. Difference. One one thing that that happened to me after, you know, learning all of this information with the book and everything is that I became more fearful of the future in a, in a way. You know, because we're talking about things that are so powerful and so beyond. But we won't have to live there. I know you're right. You're, but you know, I'm just saying though, like. I have a nine-year-old son and a seven-year-old right. daughter. Like, what's the world going to be? Hold on, we need to yeah, finish this. Got time for one more question? Yeah. Right, grab it. Up. We, <laughs> it, all right, it's too, it's too much. But I'm just thinking about what my kids are going to be experiencing a hundred years from now. That's yeah. crazy. It's it such, is, it's it's such is, a yeah. big thought. You well, know? We have time for one more question. Did you look at the planet and what the planet's going to look like, and with all the climate change and everything that's going on? Did you? Yeah, sort of. What we talked about was uh, was uh, planetary engineering. Mm -hmm. Right, which applies to our planet, but it's also like, well, is it plausible that we could uh, terraform Mars so that we could live on Mars or Venus, for example? Like, what does terraforming actually actually look like? How, how easy or difficult is it to, you know, significantly change aspects of a world? You know, it's not just about the atmosphere. There's lots of other aspects yeah. of it as well. It's really hard. Yeah. It's really hard. So if we screw things up enough, it, you know, it's, oh yeah. It's a lot easier to screw it up than to fix it. Let me just put it that way. Have you considered a more dystopian outcome where yes. the future looks more like the Bronze Age? Yeah, so in many of the chapters, we talk about here is the utopian version mm -hmm. of this technology, yeah. and but, here yeah. is the dystopian version mm -hmm. of this technology. And, you know, choose your path. Wise. Either, <laughs> you know, both of these things are possible. Let's hope we choose the utopian path. I won't give away too much, but you know, we, we absolutely explore the dystopian versions of future. I mean, you've got AI, you've got genetics, I mean, there's some it's all, lots scary of ways stuff. to destroy ourselves. Yeah. There's lots of ways to destroy ourselves. We're not careful. All right. Thank you.
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, buy, we, buy the book. Get <laughs> yeah. depressed. We want to make sure yeah, that we leave time for uh, the signing. We'll have, uh, if you'd like to get your book personalized or signed, you can follow us and uh, join us in the other room. Yeah. 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 Yeah.